going in here in the corral.
seat. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your strength. Never forget these commands that I am giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you were at home and when you were away, when you were resting and when you were working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your gate. Heaven and earth will pass away, said the Lord, but my words will never pass away.
We thank you for this wonderful day. Help Pastor Zane lead us and lift us to, to new highs for your mercy and your grace. And we ask this in your holy name. You did good, Big Daddy. Exactly, Big Daddy. Hit the lights, please. Stop. Stop. I saw what you did. Stop. Oh, good. Get up here. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to have an attorney present. If you can't have an attorney present, can't afford one, we'll one appoint it to you. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is charged. What's going on, Maddie? He, he just stole that purse from that old lady over there. Purse snatching. If I can get these handcuffs on him. Oh, my God. Seriously? Seriously. See? See that little old lady over there? Robin? Yes. <laughs> Stole her purse. Oh my God. Oh so my he's God. going to jail. You stole a pocketbook? Seriously? Joey? You're in church for crying out loud. You stole a pocketbook? I just wanted the money. Why do you need the money, honey? Everybody needs money. But, uh, Joey, honestly, a, a pocketbook? This is evidence, I guess, huh? Yes, it is. You can't touch it, ma'am. What? So he's going to prison. What, what's going to happen? He's going to go to jail. He's going to go before a bond judge. For a bond hearing, they'll issue a bond on him, but meanwhile, he's getting fingerprinted and processed and put into jail. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my God. I can't believe this. Joey, I, I'm so disappointed. I, my heart hurts. I, he's such a good guy. I mean, can't you give him a break? No, he's a good person. He's just committed a felony. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. okay how about this? How about take the handcuffs off him and put them on me? I, I'll, I'll take his place. Are you for real? Somebody's got to go to jail. Yeah. Are you willing to take his, his charges? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. I, I love him. I, I, he's, he's a friend. It's not teaching him anything, though, ma'am. I know, but, and I understand there are consequences, but I, I, Joey's my friend, and I love, I love him as my good friend, and yeah. I'm, I'm willing to... I'm going to take the blame for this. You know, I will accept well his punishment. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to come off. Um, um, He's sweating, Maddie. He's sweating. They don't want to come off. <laughs> okay. I'll get him off in a sec. Help. You got your key? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I don't do much of this anymore. Well, the way the skit was supposed to go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joey. It's all good. <laughs> Joey is not a purse, he's not a purse thief, needless to say. We set this up, and I'm supposed to be handcuffed now, but I'm not going to trust Maddie to handcuff me. <laughs> Do you see, I took his place. Who does that remind you of? Jesus did the same thing. He took our place. Why? We were guilty. <laughs> we were guilty. Caught red-handed doing all the sins that we do. And he caught us red-handed. And you know what? He said, I'll take your place. Where did he take our place? Where? On a cross. 
And his punishment was a whole lot worse than what would have happened, three hots in a cot <laughs> for Joey. <laughs> but I want to thank Joey and Maddie. She had to wear all this to come today to do the skit. But I didn't know how else to show you what Jesus did for you than this, something that would apply to you because we're all guilty of all kinds of things, but he took our place. Let's hear it for Jesus. All right, leave it to the back because you know you get closer and closer and we're all afraid you're going to fall off one day. Okay, there we go. Yeah. That might happen. Yeah, I'm talking old. closer, closer. Okay. Just a joke. Just a joke. What? <laughs> you couldn't leave the handcuffs on her, could you? <laughs> Just couldn't do it. All right. And I know he doesn't do it for recognition, but uh, <laughs> how about a big round of applause for Big Daddy, who was on there with the guitar today. <laughs> we are grateful for that. Is that better? Is that better? Can you all hear that? <laughs> Did you catch the passages of Scripture that Mel read for us this morning? That's our text. Deuteronomy and from the Gospel of Mark and uh, the Gospel writers in Matthew and Luke I think also talk about this situation where Jesus had an encounter with a lawyer, scribe, Pharisee. We'll get into that a little more in just a minute. <coughs> but what we're talking about is we get we, we're, we're still in our preparing for heaven uh, series last year we talked last month last week sometime in the past we talked about preparing a place for us Jesus said he went to prepare a place for us we talked about a home and that's our home when we become followers of Jesus we actually become citizens of heaven if we're in a right relationship with God then that's going to supersede Vicki That's because the thing is in there. Can we start over in just a second? Hang on just a minute. Ah. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Last week we talked about the promise of home and how Jesus had, had given us a home in heaven. He goes there to prepare a place for us, and if he goes to prepare that place, he's going to come again and receive us or take us. So, a lot of people have a tendency to think that if you're talking about preparing for heaven, I, I think I have some electrical tape on there. I'm just trying to get a, an idea. We'll, do, we'll work on that. Maybe so. I don't know. Uh, You don't know how I wear it. it. It's just a part of my life. It's just me. It, it, this is me. Yeah. What are you saying, Maddie? <laughs> All right. Okay, let's go back to, let's, let's get back to the message now. I've taken enough abuse. <laughs> and see, she's talking about love people out there that would tend to think that when you give your life to Christ, when you say, I'm going to become a follower of Jesus, that that is all the preparation that is necessary for heaven. But I'm telling you that biblically, that's not the end of it. That's not all the preparation that needs to be made. That decision to follow Jesus, when you say, I want, to, I want God to to look upon me with mercy because I'm a sinner 
and I'm confessing that, and I want to turn from my life of selfishness, which is base, the basis for all sin, and I want to follow Jesus, and I want to live for him. When you do that, your name is written in the book of life in heaven. So yes, you are guaranteed a spot, and nobody can ever take that away from you. But there's a certain expectation of those that follow. Express things the way we are, they're probably going to say, oh, now we know where that went. Uh, <coughs> true love. How about now? Okay. I, I, I feel like that woman that came out of the bathroom and had the toilet paper. <laughs> All right. Enough is enough, okay? Let's get back to it. There's a certain expectation when we come to Christ and we become his follower, we become a part of his bride, which is the church. We're not talking about this building or First Baptist Church building or North Walterboro building or anywhere else. We're talking about that global group of people who have died to self and been raised to life in Jesus. That's the church. It's referred to scripturally as the bride of Christ. And there's a certain expectation of Jesus that when he comes to receive his bride, that the bride he's going to receive is going to be pure. Look at it this way. If a man gave an engagement ring to a woman and they said, you know, this, is, this means that we're going to be engaged to be married and so we are now going to be exclusively with one another. But then over the three months or six months or a year between the time of the engagement, the proposal and the acceptance and the engagement and the actual marriage, if he discovered that his bride-to-be was unfaithful to him, how well do you think that marriage would work out? Do you think that marriage would take place? Would you think it unreasonable of the groom to say, I can't deal with this. I don't want this. And yet, so many folks that profess to follow Jesus and to be a part of the church live their lives in such a way that they would present to the risen, living Lord of the universe a portion of his bride that is sullied. I want you to understand that that's what the next few messages is going to, are, will be about, is that we have a responsibility to live in such a way that we are being prepared for heaven as a part of the bride of Christ. And so today we'll talk about the great commandment. <coughs> yeah, we, we, we talk about love a lot. Uh, and I'm not just talking about Christian people. Uh, all over this great land that we call the United States of America, all sorts of people talk about love quite a bit. For instance, preachers, politicians, addicts, and actors, Christians and non-Christians. We all talk about love. More than likely, if you got a bunch of those people together, not one could come to an agreement with another on what true, genuine, real love looks like. I bet if I ask you to tell me what you think real, genuine, true love looks like, we'd probably get a plethora of answers from here. Is love a warm, fuzzy feeling towards someone or something? Is love doing for someone whatever they want, even if it maybe is not, is, is, is not what they need? Is love temporary or seasonal? Can it end or is it eternal? Can you love someone and disagree with them? 
And if so, what does that look like? There, there's an undeniable truth. Some of you will, may take issue with it. That's okay. But there's an undeniable truth, and that is that for most of us, our love is conditional. We love people that love us back. We love people that can contribute something to us. And it's not always something financial or material. Sometimes we just love them because they make us feel better about ourselves. We love those who agree with us. I absolutely hate this political season. I have never seen so much hate and distress and discord in my life coming from people who express vitriol towards other people just because they disagree with them. What is happening? You know? we, we, we love based on conditions. In fact, most of us are sort of like that young lady who had second thoughts after breaking off her engagement to young Chris. She had second thoughts about it. She wrote him a note. It said something like this, by the way. No words can express the misery and the emptiness in my life since our breakup. So I'm writing simply to say that I am so sorry, and there is no one on earth who could ever replace you I love you. Would you have me back? And could things just go back to the way they were? And she signed it, and then she put, P.S., congratulations on your winning Powerball ticket yesterday. <laughs> A lot of us love that way. And quite often, that's the way we love God. Keep the blessings flowing, Lord. Let the good times roll. I love you. Now here's a little side thought. If we could love each other the way God loves us, do you know what would happen? Everybody in this room, our tension levels would drop, our stress levels would drop, the number of arguments would drop, the level of trust would go up, the drama would virtually disappear, and our relationships with one another would take on a new perspective. But unfortunately, most of the time, even in churches, we don't love each other the way God loves us. And here's the problem. Here's why that's happened. We, we have allowed the culture around us, rather than the scriptures, to influence the way we think about love. You don't believe it. I, I, I don't get into a lot of politics here. I don't even get into a lot of entertainment and stuff like that. But I was a little bit appalled last year, uh, and, and I, listen, I've seen R-rated movies. I, I, I'm, I'm not unsullied by the world. I've had that experience. But uh, there was a book that just took women by storm called Fifty Shades of Grey, and then it became a movie. I'm not asking you whether you saw it or not or whether you read the book. That's not my business, that's between you and God, but I will tell you this, from what I've seen of it, from what I've read about it, the thing that disturbed me most was that uh, if I had a little girl and she somehow got a hold of that and read it, that she would think this is love and this is the way... Uh, 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 a healthy sexual relationship between a man and a woman should occur. That would break my heart. Not to mention what I would break on him if he ever treated my daughter or granddaughter that way, you know? But that's the way we let the culture around us influence us about things like love when really we should be looking for answers about things like love in the Scriptures. Now, 
this cultural influence has affected the way we express our love to God. It's, and, and, and here's the problem. You cannot love others the way you should until you're in a right love relationship with God. Okay? You cannot love your spouse the way God intends. You cannot love your children the way you should. You cannot love your parents. You cannot love anyone else the way you really should with the right kind of love until you're in a right love relationship with God the Father. Now, in John, you know, John, John the Apostle was one of those young apostles that Jesus had called. He and his brother James were, you know, they came out of a fishing village environment where they worked with their father. And uh, uh, when you read his gospel account and when you read his letters at the end, toward the end of the Bible, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he's much older when he writes those things, and you, he's constantly using the word love, 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 love. And when he identifies the people to whom he's writing, he often calls them my little children. John was probably in his 90s when he died. But the thing is, he wasn't always that way. In fact, in some gospel accounts, he's called a son of thunder. James and John, the brothers, the sons of thunder. They were the ones who, when people in a village didn't want Jesus and the apostles to come in there and teach and do miracles, they looked at Jesus and said, why don't you let us just call fire from heaven and destroy the village? <laughs> That's what they were. But the more time they spent with Jesus, and if you remember, John was the only one who was standing at the foot of the cross. John was the one to whom Jesus said, Behold your mother. Hmm. Years later, and in exile, he's writing about love, love, love. You know what he said in 1 John 4, 19? Sure you do. All of you can quote it, right? You will be after today. You will be able to. We love because he first loved us. God is love. God is, that, that's what he says. God is love. God is the source of love. And we can love because he first loved us. God loves us. He gave his only begotten son to die for us. And we respond to that love by loving him and trusting him and obeying him. And out of the overflow of that relationship that we have with God the Father, he enables us to love our spouses, to love our children, to love our parents, to love our siblings, to love our fellow believers in Christ, and to love a lost world out there just like he did. So what does it mean to love God? Jesus was having a little encounter with the Sadducees. There were two groups of people that uh, kind of were religious leaders of that day. The, the Sanhedrin uh, was made up of Pharisees, but these Sadducees, they, they were... I, Walter Carpenter, anybody ever go to Baptist College and have a professor named J. Walter Carpenter? He was a funny old fellow. Uh, but I remember sitting in that class, and it's evidence that I'm really losing my mind and maybe get, slipping into some dementia that I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I know what happened 40 years ago in that class. He was talking to us about this encounter. Jesus had this encounter with the Sadducees, and they were asking him a question. Who, you know, the law says that if a woman is married to a man and he dies and... You know, the law says she should marry his brother if the brother is single. And suppose this happens seven times and she marries seven brothers. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? Here's the interesting thing. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And Walter Carpenter said, 
They didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. So that's how you can remember that Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. But there are Pharisees that are listening to this conversation, and, you know, Jesus says there's no, there's, she, she belongs to no one. There's no marriage in heaven. They don't marry, nor are they given in marriage. Uh, and then the scripture says in Mark chapter 12 that this young Pharisee, this young lawyer scribe, had been listening to this debate but Jesus and the Pharisees and heard him debating them well. And so he asked this question, and I honestly, based on some things, I got to tell you, uh, a, a lady by the name of Lois Verberg, Verberg great Jewish scholar who is a, a born-again Christian, I, 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 I got to tell you, I've learned more about Hebrew from her from, from two chapters of a book that I have that she wrote that I learned in Hebrew class for a semester. And uh, she just opened my eyes to some things. I don't think this guy was trying to capture Jesus in any kind of debate. I think it was a legitimate question. He wanted his interpretation, and he says to Jesus, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Okay? Now, he went on to say the second one's like it, and we'll talk about that next week. But this is the great commandment. And did you notice that? Did you notice what he didn't say? He didn't say sacrifice to the Lord. He didn't even say worship the Lord. He didn't even say obey the Lord. What did he say was the greatest commandment? Love the Lord. And you know why he would say that? Because God is love. And God always acts out of love. And a God of love, his demand of us is to love. And it begins with loving him. Now, Jesus added a word here, and there was a reason. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But if you go back to this Shema, and that's what it's called, the Shema in Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is. Actually says alone. I know a lot of people teach, use that passage to teach on a Trinity God, a Trinitarian God. And that's my fundamental belief is that God is three persons in one and one in three. And if you ever find any pastor, teacher, philosopher, or theologian that says, let me explain that to you, start doing this, da la 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 because they don't know. That's just one of those things about God that we, we cannot comprehend yet. And there'll be a day that we get there that all of this will be explained to us. But at a time when the world was just filled with pagan societies that worshipped everything from crickets to clouds, God is telling the people of Israel, I alone am your God. Worship nothing else. Now, then he says, love, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus, I, I believe if I got this right, Jesus threw in the mind. And basically, there's a reason for that. What God is telling us is, I expect you to love me physically. I expect you to love me intellectually. I expect you to love me spiritually. I expect you to love me emotionally. I expect you to make me the number one priority in your life. 
Now, simply stated, when this guy asked Jesus, what is the great commandment? What is the most important thing? Simply stated, Jesus was saying, just as the Father had said to Moses and the Israelites, because remember, the Father and Jesus are one. He was saying, you'll love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. All that you are and ever will be, all that you have and ever will have, with all of it, you love the Lord your God. Now, you know that the, you've been with me long enough to know, you know that the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. It was written in a common Greek language that was used in the marketplace. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. What the Jews spoke most of the time in, at home and in the temple was Aramaic. Okay? But when Jesus was asked this question by this guy, he responded in Hebrew. Because he was quoting Deuteronomy. The Shema. Now, some of you have seen it and you say, well, it's spelled S-H-E-M-A, and that's right, but... It's pronounced Shema. And practicing Jews still recite it twice a day as a reminder of Yahweh God's place in their lives. They still teach it to their children. There was a... I'm trying to remember a story I was reading this week about a, 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 a Jewish man that was looking for children who had been captured and then rescued during the German occupation of most of Europe. And there were folks like Schindler who had rescued some of these children and they had been dispersed to European families who protected them and saved their lives. But this man was trying to find as many of those Jewish children as he could to take them back to families that were searching for them. And he went into this orphanage in one particular place, and they had been given Gentile names. Anything they had to do to protect them from the Nazis they were doing. But they had kind of become culturalized to Europe. And so in the process of trying to find them, these directors of this orphanage say, well, I don't know what to tell you. you know, I don't know how we're going to be able to identify these children as being raised, born and raised in a Jewish household, and the guy said, give me a minute. And he started to recite in a poetic tone the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he said you could see some of the faces light up, and then the children began to respond and recite it along with him. And that's how they knew who the rescued children were. Because their parents had taught them that you recite the Shema first thing in the morning, last thing before you go to bed. God is your first thought when you wake up. He is the last thought on your mind before you go to bed at night. Now, Shema which is the first word in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, can actually be translated as hear or listen. Here's a wonderful thing about biblical Hebrew. Does this interest you at all when I start talking about this stuff? Biblical Hebrew only has about 8,000 words. What would you guess are the number of words, approximate number of words in the English language? Four hundred thousand. Yeah, I think I know about twelve of them. Uh, and I mean, every year we're getting new words. If you notice, they always, every year they have this ceremony about words that are being added to the dictionary. Pretty soon we're going to be like biblical Hebrew. You know, it has no vowels, and we're going to have we're going to be adding words like. L-M-B-A and L-O-L and stuff like that, you know, from the texting language. Vicky, quit 
teaching, she was afraid that they were going to start writing papers in that kind of language. Anyway, English has 400,000 words or so. Biblical Hebrew has only about 8,000 words. And because Hebrew has so few words, you can imagine that every word they used was stuffed with extended meaning. It had multiple meanings or mean, meant more. And Shema was one of those words. It, we translate it as hear or listen, but for English speakers, when we hear the word hear or we hear listen, listen up, listen up, we're thinking about the intellectual process of hearing what somebody is saying. But for the Hebrews, and this would include Jesus, the word Shema was used to describe not only hearing what was being said, but how you were going to act in response to what was being said. So, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You know, that verse could easily be translated into English. Hear, hear and obey Israel. The Lord our God, he is the only true God. And then comes the commandment to obey. So for Jesus and the Pharisees and the Jews, there was this expectation that you would not only hear God's words, but obey them as well. Maybe that's why James, the brother of the Lord Jesus, wrote one book in the, in the New Testament, that book of James. In the first chapter, I believe it is, he says, uh, I be doers of the word and not just hearer, hearer, hearers who deceive yourselves. Be doers and not just hearers. There's an expectation of obedience. So the first words to follow comprise what this Jewish scribe called the great commandment, and Jesus affirmed that by saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Now here's why Jesus added the word mind. If you go back and you look at the text in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you'll see three things listed. Heart, soul, and strength. Jesus says heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it was just a difference in that language. It was an expansion of the word heart. In biblical Hebrew, when they talk about heart, when they write about heart, that encompasses the mind, the thinking processes as well. The, to, uh, to the ancient Hebrew, the, the, the heart was the center of the be, being because it was the only moving part inside, the only moving organ. They felt like that was where the life was, the blood. And so they thought that not only did your emotion come from your heart, but your thinking processes came from your heart. The Hebrew word is lavev. L-E-V, or it's shortened to L-E-V sometimes. There's no vowels, so we have to put vowels in. It can be L-E-V-E-V. -E -E the best English translation of the word would be to say heart, mind, and thoughts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and thoughts. And, you know, for, for those Jews that were hearing this, they knew that heart was more than just emotion, too. You know one of the biggest distractions to commitment and submission to Jesus nowadays? It's a distortion of the gospel. And there are a lot of different ways that people distort the gospel, but here's one of them. One of the biggest distortions going on in the United States of America today among people that are church attenders and those that say they follow Jesus is the reliance on how they feel. People will move from one church to another looking for a feeling. And when they stop getting that emotional high because they things are getting things think things are getting routine or root or, or, or however you want to put it, they move on to a new place to try to get another emotional high because their faith is based on how they feel, and that's a distortion of the gospel. You know? The next time somebody says to me, Pastor, just not feeling it, brother. 
just not feeling it. I'm going to change my church because I'm just not feeling it. By the way, I don't hear that here. But remember, I work with 32 churches, so I hear it from a lot of people. So, I, And I, we've had people come here and say, I just don't feel it over there. Well, you need to go back and you need to, you need to repent. You need to talk to your pastor. You need to get right because this is more about facts than feeling. Yeah. You cannot live your life based on an emotional, warm, fuzzy spiritual experience. Yeah. To the ancient Jew, the heart was a metaphor for the mind. So when God said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, they knew that meant I will not only love God emotionally, but mentally and intellectually as well. And you know how Paul to told us to do that? He said, take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's where a lot of us fail. We are intellectually lazy in our relationship with God. Let me tell you something. Everything you say, everything you do starts in the mind. Let me also tell you that everything you watch, everything you hear, everything you read, it tries to take root in there. You determine. You determine whether it takes root. You can't unsee things. You cannot unhear things. So if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to be very careful about what you're looking at, what you're seeing, what you're taking in through the ears, through the eyes. Because so much of what's out there is stuff that is intended by the enemy to distract you from being obedient to God. Every word, every action, every attitude you express starts here. <laughs> yeah. If we had... 10% of our people spend an equal amount of time in this book as they spend scrolling through their Facebook feeds every day, it would literally revive our churches. If we had 10% of our people spending as much time in the presence of God, not only talking to him, but listening and saying, God, what do I need to change about my life? What do I need to do to be more like Jesus? It would literally revive our churches. But we'll spend more time, no, we'll spend much more time watching TV. Uh, we've, what, what is it that distracts you? What keeps you from loving God with all of your mind and all of your heart? You know, there's a thing called fasting. I'm surprised in this day and age that people still think that fasting is all about food. Fasting is about putting aside something that distracts you from the presence of God. You ever thought about going a week without any electronics and saying, you know, every time I th think about picking up my phone and scrolling through my Facebook, instead I'm going to get God's Word and I'm going to read a couple of chapters. Doing that for a week, seeing if it makes a difference in your life. You ever thought about the fact that maybe the next time somebody says, let me tell you what so-and-so's doing, or let me tell you what happened to so-and-so, and you said, you know, instead of participating in this gossip session, I think I'll just pray. And do that for a week and see how it, how it affects your life, what difference it makes. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, let me stop here and say that I know that in this romanticized era in the United States of America, where people just love to say, follow your heart. And I know that that sounds so wonderful, 
but be careful and watch who's saying that a lot because most of the people that say that kind of thing have no clue what it means to follow Jesus. If they did, they might have cracked open the book. They might have seen where God said to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. You say, well, why would he say that? You're just saying that the heart means the heart and the mind and the thoughts and the thinking. Well, haven't, ever, haven't you ever heard that God's desire is to give us new hearts? To change the way we think, to change the way we see things, to change our perspective towards people. If we're going to love God with all of our hearts, it means that we're going to love him with an utter abandon, not some warm emotional feeling. I'll have, now you, I'm a pastor, and sometimes I regret that I'm known as that because as soon as I walk in, people will say one of a couple of three things. Number one, they say, Hey, I had an uncle that was a pastor one time. Or they'll say this one. Oh, pastor. Man, I love God. I love him. Now, how many of those have you had before you told me you love God? That's not exactly the kind of spirits we're talking about, son. Anyway. You've got to understand, loving God's more than this warm emotional feeling that says, you know, God's just wonderful. I love him. I love him. I love him. Loving God with all your heart means that it uses all of your thinking processes, all of your emotions, all of your physical abilities, every part of your life to express how much he means to you. So next time... You post on Facebook, before you post it, take a moment to step back and read it and say, how does this show that I love God with all my heart? The next time you get ready to rip your spouse, take a moment to think, how is what I'm about to say to him or her going to express how much I love God? You know, you had the opportunity, many of you, to hear Francois Carr a few weeks ago. I had this wonderful love-hate relationship with Francois. I love him because of the man he is. I hate him because of the man he is, because being the man he is, when he teaches and I'm able to sit there, he always smacks me across the face with something. It's like I used to tell Vicky, I'd get so mad at her, and she'd be telling me something, and I'd be gritting my teeth, and she'd say, what are you going to tell you about it? I'd say, I hate it when you write. He told us one day, he said, we were out at Bonnie Dune, he said, let me talk to you about your relationships. <coughs> he said, if your wife is a follower of Jesus, who is it that lives in her? Jesus, right? If your boss is a follower of Jesus, who is it that lives in him? If your child is a follower of Jesus, who is it that lives in her? He said, well, if what you guys are saying is true, then shouldn't that affect the way that you talk to them? You know, would I say this to Jesus? Would I use this tone with Jesus? Would I use this language with Jesus? So you see, loving God saying I love <laughs> saying I love God is easy. Demonstrating it a little more difficult. But expect it. That is what I do show that I love God. Loving God with all our souls is to love him with the, this unflinching loyalty. I'm going to run through this real quickly. <coughs> the Hebrew word here is nephesh, and it's translated as soul. But in the Hebrew, it can also be translated as life. 
So if we love God with all of our nephesh, would mean that we would love him with every part of our life all of the time. It is to be loyal to Jesus every day, 24 hours a day, 164 hours, or 68 hours a week, 52 weeks a year for as long as we live. And this is where the distractions come in again. TV, entertainment of various sorts, hunting, fishing, politics, material things, kids' activities. You know, Francis Chan just put out a new video where he's warning parents about making idols out of their kids' activities. And let's not forget, how many days is it until kickoff for Carolina and Clemson? How many of you are excited thinking about it? Are you as excited thinking about that as you are about thinking about the fact that Jesus is here now and wants to do something great in your life? You know, things that distract us may not be bad things, but when they distract us from our relationship with God, they become idols, and we are not loving him with all of our lives, all of our souls. We fall into the practice of trying to squeeze God into our busy schedules when we ought to be building our schedules around God. That's an abomination to the God of the universe. God, I'm really busy, but I'm going to try to squeeze you in Sunday morning between 10, 30, and 12, and if Zane goes over 12, I'm going to take that 10 or 15 minutes off of next week. God, you know how busy I am. I'm working. I've got a husband. I've got a wife. I've got children. they got this and that and the other, and so I can't be involved in a small group, even if they provide them at different times and different days, because, you know, by the time I get through with all this other stuff, I'm just so tired. And remember, Lord, that's why I don't have time to read the Scriptures like I should. I know that maybe I could get up a little earlier or stay up a little later and cut off the TV and actually get into your word and spend some time praying. But God, you know how tired I am? So I'm going to squeeze you in whenever I can. You say that to the God of the universe? Really? You say, no, I'd never say that. Do you show it with your lives then? God knows your heart. We're going to love him with all of our lives and souls. That means we love him above everyone and everything else. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, I, I like the way Matthew's Gospel puts it. He says, you know, if you love your wife, or your husband, or your children, or your father, or your mother more than me. You aren't worthy of me. Get that? Sometimes we can even make an idol out of family life. Whoever loves your wife, or your children, your father, mother, brothers, sisters, if you love them more than me, you're not worthy of me. Do you realize what he's saying about the greatest commandment a little better? How about loving God with all of our strength? It's, it's really an, inf an unfettered obedience to him in everything. The, the, the Hebrew word, meokadah, I like saying that say it enough, it'll end up somebody's name. Literally, the translation is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your very. <laughs> you like that? Are you like those Jewish scholars who said, what does that mean? We have to put a word in there. We cannot translate it. All of your very handwritten notes. Very in Hebrew, ending the sentence that way required them to contemplate and meditate on what very he was talking about. 
one Jewish translator decided that the best way to translate it was, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your oomph. We might translate it, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your gusto. In other words, everything. So, if I have a position of authority or responsibility, you know what my first thought should be? How do I use this position to love God? If you have skills, talents that are natural, you know what you should be saying? If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be what God wants you to be, if you how do I use these things to show how much I love God? Do you have money? How do I use my money to show that I love God? Relationships? I know for some of us it may be, I didn't mean it that way, darling. For some of you, I started to say for some of us it may be too late. Now, how do you think she would have taken that? For some people, it may be too late. They may say, it's thinking, you know what, I, I shouldn't have married this person. Well, you made a vow and a commitment before God, and now it's there, and God will make the best of it if you trust him and if you obey him and you love him with all your heart. But for those of you young people, man, when you're even considering a relationship, a young man or a young woman, you better be thinking, how will this late relationship bring glory to God and show that I love him? And spouses ought to be doing that, and you ought to be encouraging one another to do that. Because this relationship is not about me and Vicki. It's about how each of us can show how much we love God in our relationship with one another. <laughs> Your direction in life? Are you still waiting for the brass ring? Are you waiting for your ship to come in? I mean, if you're like me and you're 62 years old, closing in on 62, you realize the ship's sailed and the brass ring has passed and it's not going to get any better than this. So glory to God. Let me use what time I have left with what little I have to bring glory to God and show that I love him. That's what he wants. The reason is, but I'm to bring in Rick Warren's phrase here, because it's not about you. It's about God. Love the Lord your God with all your very, whatever it is. Whatever it is. have a better understanding about how you're supposed to love God now? The greatest commandment. It's the greatest thing you can ever do. I can't imagine that at some point when we do get to heaven, one of the questions we ask of us at the judgment seat of Christ is, did you love me with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength? Do you? Can you prove it? Does it show? When people hear your language, when they hear what you speak of and see what you post, and when they watch attitudes, do they see that you love God? If someone were to grab your checkbook or see your bank statement, would they be able to tell from that that you love God with everything that you are and have? That's your calendar. People looked at how busy your schedule was. How much time would they see that you're giving to God? Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment pretty simple hear and obey this the Lord 
our God, he alone is our God. So love him. In your thoughts, in your feelings, in your strength, in your abilities, let every part of your life scream, I love God. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit is within me. I love God with all that I am and have. And when you do that, everything else falls into place. You know what this means? This means that God, God is just there for us. He's going to give us everything that we need. He's, he's, he, but he has to be the only thing that we worship in our life. He can be trusted on every mountaintop, but he can also be trusted in every dark valley. He expects us to be totally submitted and surrendered to him and not holding anything back, and he certainly expects us to obey all that he has commanded us to do. Is that you? Let's pray together. Listen, if this is the greatest commandment, what you've got to do is ask yourself the question, how am I measuring up to it? Am I really loving God with everything that I am and everything that I have? To some of you, I want to ask you today, have you received God's great gift of love, first of all? Someone of you here that not trusted Christ, you've not decided to follow him, maybe today you hear his voice saying, this is your day. Don't harden your heart today because this is the still small voice that says, follow me. Can, can your initial act of worship today be to submit and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus? And it's pretty easy. You just say. It's a confession. It's a, an acknowledgement. It's a prayer, something like this. God, I know I am a sinner and that I can't change that about myself. There's nothing good in me that deserves you. But I also know that that's why you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. He took my place, just like in the little drama today. He took my place, my penalty, my punishment. Today, God, I accept his sacrifice and thank you for that and for the forgiveness of my sins. And I want to turn from my sinful, selfish nature and I want to begin to love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength as I follow you with all my heart. You know, you pray that prayer or something like it, Jesus hears it. God knows it and, you know, the Spirit of God comes to free you from the burden and the penalty of your sins. It comes to live in you. Your life's name is written in the book of life in heaven. The beginning of a new life, a new start. Did you pray that prayer? If you did, would you just hold your hand up for just a moment so one of our elders can get to you with some material? This is your public acknowledgement. You're saying, I've decided today that I'm going to follow Jesus with all my heart. Now, for the many of you that are already followers of Jesus, I ask you some questions. Is there anything that you are withholding from God? Is there any part of your life that you're holding back? You're saying, I love God, but I haven't released this to him yet. Any part of your life that you've not surrendered to him. Maybe it's your job situation. Maybe it's something going on in your family. Maybe it's a, a financial issue. Maybe it's your temperament. Your attitude. Would you just let your vow to God today be, I'm going to surrender everything. I'm not going to hold on to anything tightly, God. I'm going to release it into your, your hands. I trust you, and I'm going to obey. Whatever you lead me to do, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to obey you with a whole heart. 
for some of you, if you're a follower of Jesus today, and another question, are you obeying him with all of your life? These are just practical questions. You know? Are you living in open rebellion? You say, I don't know what that means. I would rebel against God. Well, you know, James also wrote and said, to the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. So, is there a right thing that you know you should do, but you're choosing not to? Would you make a turnaround on that today? Say, God, whatever it costs me, whatever, it, how, however much pain it may cause me, in order to be in a right relationship with you, I'm going to let this thing go. Is there a habit, an addiction, anything that you need to sacrifice in order to be obedient to him? Would you do that today? It's a little place on your sheet there where you can put as a result of what I've heard and what God has said to me today, here's some things I'm going to do. Do them quickly. The enemy is going to come to you and he's going to say, you can do this tomorrow, you can do it sometime later in the week. But let me tell you, the longer he can distract you and keep you from doing these things, the more difficult it will be to follow through. Would you do those things today? Just write them down before you leave today and get busy with it. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for how much you love us and for the fact that your love is unconditional. You accept us as we are. You pay the price for our sinfulness. You lovingly welcome us into your family when we submit and repent and turn. And God, then you shelter us and teach us and redirect us as children as we grow into maturity. God, I pray for those who today may have prayed that prayer to follow Jesus for the first time. God, strengthen them as they begin this walk of faith and help them to know that you don't just start off mature. I pray for those who are followers of Jesus. God, that you'd bring some of those into the lives of those younger folks that are Christians, newer in the faith, to mentor and to encourage and to help. But I pray for those of us that follow Jesus too, that we'd hear your voice and know your spirit as you bring conviction to us about things that we cling to that we need to release so that we can obey you. Help us to be quick to do that and to be ruthless in dealing with sin in our lives so that we can demonstrate to the world around us that we love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. Thank you for being here and for changing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Nova Nation Band got something for us? Yeah. Stand and sing and do as you need. <laughs>
next Sunday. All right, everybody, you got an announcement sheet, I hope. But next Saturday at 10 o'clock, Greg McCool and uh, Seacoast will be here for the Proverbs 226 ministry. If you want to know more about how our church can be involved in that, come on out Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, okay? Thank you for being here.